Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about some more experimental aircraft. A little while ago I made a video talking about the V-173 so-called pancake plane, which was designed in such a way to make VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing, technically possible, it just needed a strong headwind or a carrier moving at a decent speed to actually achieve this by itself. In reality, it was closer to a short takeoff and landing, or S-tall plane, but I digress. The V-173, despite its rather strange appearance, was really an attempt to incorporate the V-tall or S-tall concept into how a standard plane takes off, you know, down the runway and all that. Other designers had a different approach to the V-tall concept that was much more direct. Instead of having the plane sit horizontally like normal, why not have it sit vertically and give it enough thrust to take off that way? There were a few attempts made by American designers after World War II to make these so-called tail sitters, but those aren't the planes I want to focus on today. Instead, I want to look at two designs from Germany at the very end of World War II, two tail sitting plane designs that were meant to solve a very, very serious issue for Germany. Two designs that ultimately never even hit the prototype stage, as the war ended before they could even progress that far. Two designs that basically only exist today in model form, and two designs that are incredibly bizarre looking. These are the Fake Wolf, Triebflugel, and the Heinkel Lersche. The problem that these two planes were designed to solve was one that Germany sought to solve so much, that it made several other experimental planes that actually reached some kind of production, one of which was a tail-sitting vertical launcher, but at least that one actually made it into some kind of production. The problem was that Allied bombers were just decimating Germany, with Allied forces on all sides launching seemingly endless bombing runs on Germany, they wanted some kind of plane that could very rapidly take off to intercept the incoming bombers as more standard, typical planes were just too slow. This led to planes like the ME-163 and the vertical launching Natter, which I have talked about in a previous video. Unfortunately for Germany, these projects were not all that effective and certainly weren't enough to slow the Allied advances, so all of these planes, including the subjects of this video, failed in their ultimate goal. In the Triebflugel and the Lerche, we see two of the more conceptually bizarre and fanciful solutions to this problem. We'll start with the Triebflugel, as its design made it further along for what that's worth. Measuring in at 30 feet tall and with a wingspan of 38 feet, the Triebflugel looks like it would be a secret unlockable plane in an ace combat game. Instead of standard wings, the Triebflugel had three large rotor blades each of which had adjustable pitch that would rotate around a central axis. Powering it would be some combination of three single-use rockets, two German Walter 109-501 RATO units, and three Pabst ramjets with 2,000 foot-pounds of thrust each. To take off, the pilot would either fire off the three single-use rockets simultaneously, each of these would be located in the wing slash propeller tips. Alternatively, he would activate the two RATO units located somewhere to create that initial movement in the propeller. Once the propeller reached an adequate enough speed, this would allow the ramjets, also located in the propeller tips, to fire, thus delivering the main thrust of the propeller and thus the craft. The ramjets themselves would ideally be fed from fuel tanks in the fuselage, somehow. When the plane lifted off the ground, the tail-mounted wheels could retract for better aerodynamics. Once at a designated height, the plane would level out and sort of fly like a normal plane, just with a giant jet-powered propeller and no real wings. With this strange propulsion setup, its maximum estimated speed would be around 620 miles an hour. The plane would ideally be controlled through the four tailplanes that would have both needed the rudders and elevators. In flight, due to a lack of proper lifting wings, the plane would have to be kept at a slight upward angle to maintain its height. It would be outfitted with two 30mm MK-103 cannons and two 20mm MG-151 cannons. 
each angled slightly downward to both compensate for the slight upward tilt it needed, and for the fact that most of the targets it would have, aka the bombers, would be below it. Once its mission was complete, landing would have been rather tricky. Somehow, the pilot would get the plane back into a vertical position and would slowly power down the ramjets, allowing the plane to drop back down on the now re-extended tailwheels. Now, how exactly the pilot would go about doing this on a very consistent basis is not really explained, because, after all, the plane would never make it past basic wind tunnel testing. How the plane would exactly manage anything about itself, like maintaining fuel to the propeller tips or just being relatively controllable in the air is basically unknown, and we'll probably never really know. But we can hypothesize about what it would have been like if the plane actually made it to the prototype phase, and I think that's what we'll do here. So, if the Triebflugel was actually made, I would assume that the biggest issue in the design would arise from the propeller-mounted ramjet engines and single-use rockets. In addition to supplying fuel to them through the fuselage, I think the biggest issue would arise from the timing of the jets and rockets. If they all didn't fire in unison, or if one or two of them happened to just fail, it would likely throw off the balance of the plane, and at high speeds would lead to at best control issues, and at low speeds or on takeoff, would probably make the thing wobble around and fall over. I think that eventually the propeller-mounted thrusters would just be dropped as being too finicky and difficult to manage properly, and either the propeller would be powered by a single internal engine, or the propeller would be dropped outright for a basic rocket or jet thruster. So basically, it would just evolve into the manned V1 rocket program a program that was cancelled in March 1945, which means that inevitably the Triebflugel would have just fizzled out into nothing. Now let's move on to what I think was the more viable of the two projects, which isn't really saying all that much, the Heinkel Lersche. From this point forward, I will be calling it the Lark, as that's what Lersche is in English, and I think it's easier to say. And why didn't I do that with the last plane? That's because I like saying Triebflugel. So anyway, to describe it simply, the Lark looks like a missile with a donut around it. Measuring in at 30 feet 10 inches long and 13 feet 1 inch wide, located inside that donut would be the main source of propulsion, two contra-rotating propellers. These propellers would be powered either by two Daimler-Benz DB605 engines or two Daimler-Benz DB603 engines. With these engines, the maximum estimated speed would be around 500 miles an hour. The pilot would control this by laying in a prone position instead of being in a seated position like normal, and would see through the clear nose cone. The lift in standard flight would be generated from that donut, it being a nine-sided annular wing, meaning that it was connected in a way that it would have no wing tips, ideally reducing the drag that wing tips normally cause. How exactly the pilot would control the yaw, the roll, and the pitch is unknown. No control methods were ever actually designated here. Presumably, rudders and elevators would be incorporated into the donut or tail, but again, it doesn't really say. A predecessor to the Lark, known as the Wasp, appeared to have two small wing protrusions that, I assume, would have had some of those elements. For its main armaments, the Lark would be outfitted with two 30mm MK-108 cannons, and, as an optional attachment, up to three of the innovative Ruhr-style X-4 air-to-air missiles. Of course, while the Lark itself would fizzle out into basically nothing, the X-4 missiles, which were wire-guided, would end up being highly influential, and served as the effective basis for early guided missile technology in later Cold War proxy wars. But back to the Lark, much like the Triebflugel, it was expected that the pilot would lift off the ground like a helicopter before sort of leveling out into standard flight. Having an actual wing, the Lark ideally wouldn't have to keep the nose slightly raised as the wing would generate some actual lift. Again, like the Triebflugel, it was expected that the pilot would then somehow bring the plane back to its vertical position and slowly drop back down to the ground. 
With both of these planes, this is possible, but the pilots would likely need a lot of training to be able to do this reliably and consistently, which, given where the war was at, this is something they really couldn't accomplish. Still, though, it never actually got to that point, as the initial design work on it began in February 1945 and concluded in March 1945, but these were just drawings, and it would really advance no further than that. So, if the Lark was actually made, what would have been the biggest obstacles? Apparently, the design itself has been reviewed in hindsight, and is apparently structurally and aerodynamically sound, so that aspect was probably fine. Given that it wouldn't have the propulsion timing issues that I think the Triebflugel would have, I think the biggest issue would be the aforementioned pilot training. I think it would eventually reach the point where it would be determined that it was just too difficult and finicky to land on the tail wheels, and instead, they would just have the pilot activate a parachute or something and float back down to Earth. If they did that, though, what would really be the difference between it and things like the ME-163, the Natter, or the manned V-1 rockets? Inevitably, I think that the Lark, along with the Triebflugel, would basically be absorbed into one of the other bomber interceptor programs, and eventually fold under. As one final note, I do want to answer this question of, do I think either of these planes would really impact the war if they were made? The answer to that is no, probably not. While the constant bombing runs were certainly a problem for Germany, I can't imagine that Germany would have the resources or manpower to do anything other than just stall the inevitable for a little bit longer. Even if they were able to somehow push out a number of these and they were actually effective, they still lack the overall resources and manpower to hold off the Russians, the British, and the United States combined. At that point, Germany was screwed, and nothing they could do would really fix that. And so, with that, we're going to go ahead and stop for today. So, thank you all for watching. Of course, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, we're back to more regular content after last week being a little sort of story time episode, I guess. And honestly, I like making these kinds of videos more anyway. The little story time videos are fun to read, but I think they are, I guess, more fun to actually just read them instead. Of course, I'll be back next week with a new video as well. Uh, I think I might make one about a gun next, but I'm not entirely sure yet. But still, be sure to tune in. I hope you like this video, and at the very least, I hope you learned something. So, see ya.